Your grace. 
So good, glad to be in the house of the Lord today. And uh, I was, I told Brother Ledbetter yesterday, and it was true all the way up until this morning. <clears throat> I did not have a clue what I was going to preach today. And sometimes it's weird. I, I don't know if everyone can understand this, but sometimes it's so strong and you know what you're going to preach and you know that you're just exactly in the vein of the Spirit. And then some days it's just kind of you have to trust in the Lord. We always have to do that. But anyway, my mindset was what would I want if, if, they, if everyone here heard nothing else? What would I want them to hear? What would the Lord want them to hear? And so I'm going to preach a message today. And don't let the title throw you off, but I want to preach about the second revelation of John. The second revelation of the Apostle John. I'm going to go to our scripture text. I didn't realize that would be so dark up there. <clears throat> this is 1 John, the epistle of John, towards the back of the Bible. I'm just going to tell you, one of my favorite apostles and one of my favorite authors of the Bible is John. So I'm a little biased today. But John writes, In this was manifest the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. That's the way that God designed us. We are to live through Christ. Herein, John says, is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, and I'll explain that in a little bit, the propitiation for our sins. And beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Amen. 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 You may be seated. <clears throat> I wish that I could give everyone a glimpse today of how powerful and how entertaining and how precious the Word of God is. Amen. You see, a lot of folks don't know a whole lot about it. It's just a book that sits on the coffee table and we have to dust it off from time to time. And we start reading it and we get into this beget this one and this one beget this one and, and we get to the tabernacle plan and some of those things are hard. If you need some sleep medication, just read the tabernacle plan. <laughs> but the only way I know to explain it is like this. It's like a friendship. When you have a friend, there's, there's things that you love about a friend and then there's things that you just take with that friendship. And that's how it is with the Word of God. There's things that we can love about the Word of God. And then there's things that we just have to digest because it's there. But it's always intended for our good. Because God is the author of it. Right. <clears throat> the Apostle John, uh, when you begin to study the Bible and you look in the New Testament... You're going to see that John, writing his writings was a different approach from the others. Uh, there's a, I, I don't have a lot of time to go into all of this, but in one of the major prophets, and then in Revelation, there's a, a 
creature called a seraphim that's like an angelic creature. And it has four faces. And when you study it all out, uh, these four faces are the four faces of Christ, but they're also the four faces of the Gospels because there's four Gospels in the beginning of the New Testament. And so you have Matthew. Matthew, when you read his Gospel, he is trying to prove that he's writing to the Jewish people and he is trying to prove to the Jewish people that this is their Messiah, this is the King that is to come. And so one of those faces is a lion. And so Matthew is trying to present Christ as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of Israel. Then we have Mark. Mark was a different writer. His audience was different. He was actually writing to the Gentiles. And during this time, Rome was the ruling empire of the world. And uh, they had servitude or slavery, but not the kind that we think of. Their slavery actually helped people become Roman citizens. And so if you become a slave and you work your way up, it actually helped you buy your citizenship to become a Roman. It actually bettered your life. But Mark writes and he, he uh, shows Jesus one of the faces was an ox and he portrays Jesus as a servant. In fact, Isaiah describes him as the suffering servant. Luke comes along. If you'll look it out, Luke... Uh, the the most times in the Gospels he refers to Jesus as the Son of Man. He gives a genealogy of Jesus in the beginning of his Gospel that's different from Matthew's, and this is why, because his genealogy is actually Mary's genealogy, which is how Jesus is even the Son of David to begin with. And so he presents Jesus as the Son of Man. I did all that to get to this point. John comes along. Most people believe that John, if I remember right, I think he wrote Revelation first, and then he wrote his three epistles, and then the last book he wrote was the Gospel of John. And John comes along and he says, hold on a minute, all you guys have focused on this lateral stuff, and I want us to, I got a job that I have to do, this is my calling, I'm the exegete, I'm to explain and to manifest and to show you who Jesus is. And so many people consider the Gospel of John the genesis of the New Testament. And this is what he writes in his very first verse. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. Verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. Which were born not of the blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man but of God. And the Word, and that word, word there, if anybody has studied any of this, is Logos. And I talked about this a few weeks ago. But that means the expression of God. God has always expressed Himself. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. So John, his writing, his ministry, his very spiritual being, John said, my calling is to manifest Jesus to everyone that I can come in contact with. To whoever, whoever will read my epistles, whoever will hear my voice, I want to tell them who Jesus is. And his whole writing, that's what you're going to find. He's, he's exegeting about Jesus. John chapter 2, we find the marriage of Cana of Galilee and Jesus turns the water into wine. And John writes, and this began he to manifest forth his glory. Manifest means reveal. The book of Revelation, brother, we've been talking about it a lot. Oh, by the way, when brother Robert was talking about Wednesday nights and he was saying... 
uh, negativity or whatever. That wasn't me. That was Brother Baxter. He wasn't talking about me. But the book of Revelation's title is actually the revel, look in your Bibles, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because John feels like this is his calling. This is what he's trying to do. John chapter 3, there's a man named Nicodemus that goes to night school. And he comes to Jesus by night and asks him questions. And Jesus begins to tell him, except a man be born again. And reveals things to Nicodemus. John chapter 4, there's a woman at the well. Jesus has an appointment. Nobody else knows about it, but there he is sitting at the well when she gets there. He's waiting on her. And revelation begins to happen in this woman. John chapter 5, Pool of Bethesda. And on and on we could go. John is exegeting. John chapter 6, he feeds the multitudes. John is exegeting who Jesus is. Because that's the revelation that John is trying to tell everyone of. We could talk about, when you look at the Gospel of John, you have all kinds of, you look it up and they said seven IMs, but there's way more than that. You find Jesus and John all the time saying, I am. I am the light of the world. I am the door to the sheepfold. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And then he, he blew their minds and, and had them kind of out of sorts when he, he said, your father Abraham wanted to see my day and he saw it. And rejoiced and was glad. And they said, you're not even 50 years old yet. How has a And he said, before Abraham was, I am. And John put all that in his writings because he wanted everyone to know Jesus is not just a good idea or not just a good suggestion or not any of those things that's a, or any kind of a, a good option. Jesus is the way, the truth, the truth. And the life. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the bread of life that comes down from heaven. In other words, we all need Jesus. We all need more of Jesus. We need to know Jesus better. We need to be closer to Jesus. Jesus needs to be the number one in our life. And that is what John is trying to express to us when he reveals Christ. Unto us. But then, this came to me a while back, and it, it kind of, I hope it affects you the way it affected me. John goes through all this trouble to reveal Jesus in his writings, but there's a second revelation that you can find in John, and I'm going to give you the verses, and you can look them up for yourself later on. John chapter 13, verse 23. John chapter 19, verse 26. John chapter 20, verse 2. John chapter 21, verses... This is the, the kicker right here because he puts it twice in the same chapter. John 21, 7 and, and verse 20. And in those writings, this is what John says. One of them, I think it's uh, chapter 13, is the marriage... Or not the marriage supper, but the, the last supper. And it says, The one whom Jesus loved had his head on Jesus' breast. And in these verses, you're going to see that John writes, the one whom Jesus loved. Well, all through the years when I read the Bible, I always thought, well, John's just trying to be humble. And he doesn't want to write his own, he's the author, and so he doesn't want to write his own name there because he's trying to be humble. And so he just doesn't want to say, John, 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 throughout his gospel and his writings. But it came to me later on, the second revelation that John had. And this is what it is, and it's going to seem real simple maybe, but I just want you to bear with me, I, and, I, and I'm going to say it, and I want it to sink in for a minute. I'm going to be quiet. Think about how powerful, I went through all that introduction to show you how powerful John's revelation of Christ was. But his second revelation, Brother Chris, was this. Jesus loves me. Yeah. 
If I never, if you never seen me again and I never could tell anyone in this building anything ever again, the most important thing that you could ever know is that Jesus loves you. Now here's the thing. We use love so much. I love my dog. I love cake. I love pie. I love my wife. I love my children. I love that car. I love that truck. But that's not what love means when John said Jesus loves me. John goes through this whole I mean, you can look at it for yourselves, this whole deal where he's bringing Jesus down from heaven. He is showing us that Jesus is the divine one. Jesus is God manifest in flesh. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the great God of glory. But yet, he loves Brother Robert mentioned this, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. He died for me even though I'm not perfect. He died for me and loved me even though sometimes I'm not very lovable. Right. I didn't earn it. I could, not, I could not earn it. I don't deserve it. You see, I know that Jesus was crucified some 2,000 plus years ago. But when those high priests was slapping him in the face and spitting on him and, and the covering, tying a blindfold around his face and saying, prophesy. You're so, you're so godly and you're such a prophet. Prophesy and tell us who just smote you in the face. And when those Roman soldiers, this was their craft and they began to whip him and to beat him. And we could go on and on about the brutality of the cross. You see... Yes, that was a Roman soldier, but really that was me. Because it was my sin that put Jesus on that cross. But I want you to know what he said. He said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He loved you and I so much. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, a circumstance. I kind of talked about this on Easter. He wasn't a victim of circumstance. If Jesus was the victim of anything, I'm going to tell you what he was the victim of. He was a victim of love. It was love that carried him to Jerusalem. When you read, you'll find that he went around and dodged it the whole time, but as the time got closer and he began to ride to Jerusalem, he cried with a, a deep groaning in his spirit. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you as a mother hen does her chicks, but yet you would not. And love drove him to Jerusalem. It was love that had him in the garden of Gethsemane as he prayed and he pulled at the ground. And he said, if it be possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. It was love that drove him to a hill called Golgotha that caused him to carry an old rugged tree. After all the stripes that had been laid on his back, they laid a splintery beam on him and made him carry it. It was love that drove him and gave him the strength that he needed. To finish his mission. And now. 
Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation. We're going to have troubles in this world. Shall distress. Anybody had any distress lately? Anybody stressed? Persecution. Famine. Nakedness. Peril or sword. As it is written, for they, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Paul says, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. No matter what you face in life. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And Paul says, now, Paul's got his own history. I probably shouldn't take time to go into it. But I'm just going to tell you that Paul knew who Jesus was too. And he said, I am persuaded. And Paul said that, you can take it to the bank. He said, I'm convinced, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. God loves us with the love that our culture our society has become so self-absorbed that it's hard for us to even comprehend what love even is. You remember when you first started dating? Forgive me because we just got back from marriage retreat. I got a strike while the iron's hot. You remember when we used to talk on the phone, go to sleep, still had the phone there, and we wasn't even talking, but we just wanted to spend time together. We just wanted to know one another. Yes. I love my wife. Brother uh, Sergeant, he talked about the marriage covenant. A covenant is different from a contract. If somebody breaks the contract, the contract's null and void. But what a covenant says is this, even if you don't do it, I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to keep my covenant with you. And that's the kind of relationship, that's the love of God. That's the love of Jesus. He is in covenant with us. I love my wife. I don't want to lie to her. I don't want to hurt her. I don't want to play around somewhere that I shouldn't be because I love her. And God wants that reciprocated back to Him because He says, I love you so much. I've, get, I've, did, a, I've did all I can do. I've gave everything. I paid the highest price. 